Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. Football is undoubtedly America's favorite sport. The NFL has grown into a revenue-generating juggernaut. Total revenue was a little over $4 billion in 2001 and has increased each year to now over $14 billion. Commissioner Goodell stated in 2010 he believed the NFL would reach $25 billion annual dollars in revenue by 2027. In this episode, I'm going to give you the secret sauce that can keep the NFL on track to meet this target. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This week, as we step off our DeLorean, I'm going to first give you an apology, because last week I told you that we're going to talk about a dude that had one of the coolest pure football names of all time, and that guy would be Bronco Nagurski, who was born in 1908. However, I got a little bit ahead of myself, because this episode is going to be different. We're not going to go take that DeLorean up to 88 miles an hour and go to a specific moment in time. We're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to call an audible. This is the week where we get to listen to the fans of the show and the fans of football. I have five different listeners that sent in audio clips of their favorite football moments. And we're going to listen to them tell their story, their personal story, about why they love the game of football. So strap your helmets on and let's get ready to rumble. But before we get there, I do want to put a little bit of ground rules down for you. Because this is the first episode, so I gotta tell you what this thing's all about. You see, I started this new thing called My Football Moment. Where anybody wants to share their own personal story or experience with the great game of football, we'd love to have you on the show. But there are going to be a few different rules. And uh, some of the ground rules are first, please keep this to right around five minutes or less. Uh, We want to make sure that everyone can get a fair shake. And then the other rule is, I mean, this is a family show, so please keep everything clean, you know what I mean? And when we put these shows out there, we're just going to base it on a first come, first serve. So that's how I reported it here in this episode. Each listener that we're going to feature is going to be in the order that they sent the audio clip to me. And if you're interested in doing something like this, I mean, it can be anything, really. Think about it. If you close your eyes and you ask yourself, What is my football moment? Something popped in your head just now. That's what you could talk about. You're going to see that the stories kind of run the gamut. Some are about a specific game. Some are about kind of like an entire span of enjoying football. To even down to one person talks about just a specific play. So, I mean, anything you want. I'd love to have you on the show. And if you really want to, you can get more details if you head over to myfootballmoment.com. But let's get into this thing. You don't want to listen to me. You want to listen to the cool stories that are coming from our listeners of the Football History Dude. And the first one to take on all comers is going to be Mr. Jaden Kuypers. He was the first to send in his football moment. And here's his clip. Hey guys, uh, my name is Jaden Kuypers. I'm here to share my favorite football moments with the Football History Dude. Um, I've loved the game for as long as I can remember. When I was really little, my dad would have me line up my football cards on offense and defense so that I could learn their positions. 
Um, video games is another one of the first things I remember about football. Um, it played a big role in accelerating my interest in the NFL. Uh, from the very first game day on PlayStation all the way through the current Madden 18. You know, I've had a new one every year since I was like eight years old. Uh, went a long way as far as keeping me up with player names and uh, how plays would develop on the field. Uh, most eight-year-olds out there don't have much patience for anything other than immediate stimulus or you know the crazy action. But I would sometimes sit there and simulate all the way through entire seasons just because I enjoyed working with the salary cap and the whole roster management aspect of the games. Um, as far as fantasy football goes, I started getting into that when I was about 11 years old. Uh, I started a league that's still going strong today with 19 seasons in the books. Um, my favorite moment there happened in 2002 uh, after the early slate of Sunday games. Uh, things were looking grim for me in my matchup. I was down a boatload of points and all I had left was Sean Alexander in the Sunday night game, you know, so I was pretty down about it. But uh, he proceeded to have five touchdowns in the first half of the game against the Vikings and uh, he ended with a couple hundred yards, which sealed the victory for me which I didn't see coming so that was pretty cool. Uh, real football wise I've had quite a few memorable experiences but I'll stick with a couple here. Uh, in 98 my dad took me along to Hawaii to see the Pro Bowl. Uh, we also had passes to check out the practice the day before it. Um, there was a lot of all-time greats there, um, big name players like John Elway, Steve Young, Barry Sanders uh, to name a few of them. Uh, Mike Allstock who was my favorite player of all time, was hanging out by the pool at our hotel. Um, at practice, I was wearing a Randy Moss jersey, and I asked him to sign it for me, but I got completely snubbed. Uh, he just walked right past me. Uh, needless to say, I didn't wear that jersey to the actual game the next day. Um, in the end, my favorite football-related moment that I've had is probably the Rams winning Super Bowl thirty four. Uh, my dad is a huge fan. Um, he had gone his whole life without them bringing the Lombardi home. Um, it happened in such dramatic fashion, too, with Trent Green going down in the preseason and uh, the GOAT, Kurt Warner, coming in off the streets. Uh, it was just really sweet to see his reaction and his joy when Kevin Dyson got tackled on the one-yard line reaching out for the end zone, you know, and it just uh, it's just pretty crazy. Um yeah, that's about it, though. Uh, thanks for having me chime in. Uh, if anybody would like to talk football, fantasy, or otherwise, just uh, search Medieval Gridiron on Twitter, and you'll find me. Uh, catch you on the flippity flop. So now that you hear that, I mean, I could totally relate with him. Like, the part that he said, I mean, simulating the Madden seasons, even when he was, like, a little dude, it just reminded me of my past. I, I really did just sit there all night long. I remember my cousin Chris and my brother Mikey, and we would sit there with Madden, and we would try to create a uh, franchise, and we would take turns simulating through the season. I mean, it's just totally relatable, man. And I'll tell you what, Jaden, I'll catch you on the flippity-flop, man. And like he said, you can go ahead on Twitter and find him if you search in Medieval Gridiron. And his Twitter handle is at Jaden underscore Kuypers. That's C-U-Y-P-E-R-S. Let's get on to our next listener. His name is Frank Bonacontri, and he has a cool personal experience that most of us cannot replicate. And here's that audio clip. Hey, this is Frank Bonacontri with the, the Fantasy Football Wire. Find me on Twitter at the FFL Wire. Shout out to Football History Dude. Great topic on a favorite football moment. Wanted to throw it in here for my favorite football moment. It's got to be game I went to, Packers, Ravens, Monday Night Football 2009. I grew up in Baltimore. I live in Wisconsin. Dual citizenship on both teams. Um, been to a lot of Packer games, uh, mostly cold weather games, because the only way you can get tickets up here Contrary to what you've heard, is if you know people that have season tickets, they'll usually sell you the late season games. They don't want to sit in the cold. So most of the games I've been to have been regular season December games. So I've been out in the cold plenty of times, no big deal. This one was Monday night, 2009. A buddy of mine has a sports training 
business. He trains athletes and college kids and stuff. He said he could get me some tickets. I told him I don't care what it costs. Get them for me. He scored me tickets for like 40 bucks each. We all went, me, my wife, him and his wife. I have no idea where we're sitting. I don't know what to expect. I've never even been to a Monday night game ever in my life. They've all been regular season Sundays. The um, the games at Lambeau Field, December, 20 degrees. Wind chills probably 12 or 13. Um, didn't do much for tailgating just for the time and getting up there. But the tailgating, as we walked through the parking lot, it was insane. I mean, Raven fans were taking over the place. Green Bay is solid when it comes to tailgating and filling up parking lots. I mean, it's in a neighborhood, so you've got just madness all over the place. But there was a ton of Raven fans. I was pretty curious to see what kind of turnout they get, how many guys from Baltimore or Raven fans in general are even in Wisconsin. But they were out in full force. They had spots of the parking lot taken over. There's a uh, bus that's converted into like a tailgating Hang out, flooded with Packer fans. They were up in balconies. It was crazy. I couldn't believe it. I went through the parking lot and I seen guys dressed up like the Old Bay Crab, Johnny Unitas, in full costume. They're smoking cigars. It was nuts. So I, it was an experience just getting from the car to our seats. So we get in the stadium, <clears throat> we find our seats. They're on the second row of the end zone. This My guy is money. I don't know how he even scored these tickets, how he got them, but I could not believe it was that close. I've never sat that close in Lambeau Field. I've always been out on the corners, the fringe, you know, upper upper area. So this, to sit that close, was insane. So I had my coat, jersey, pants. You dress the part when you go to these late late season games so you're warm. So the only thing I didn't have on was gloves. Because I was taking pictures nonstop, so my hands were pretty much purple the whole game. But the the first part of the game, I had Jermichael Finley jump into the stands on his first touchdown um, right in front of me. So we all got to run down and slap his helmet. It was it was insane to have a Lambo leap right in front of me. Then later on in the game, he had a second touchdown. Same thing. The Ravens also had a touchdown from uh, Kelly Washington. He tried to jump in the stands, and he got rejected. It was great. I ran down there. I slapped his helmet, but most of the other fans, they all poured beer on him, shoved him back onto the field, and then he was just yelling back at us from the field, and I'm sitting there rooting him on. It was just crazy. It was an awesome game. They did the uh, the national anthem at the start of the game. Is really, if you're at any Baltimore-involved team or event, you're going to get a feel of how many Baltimore true Baltimore fans are there by the national anthem because in Baltimore, if you don't know, during the national anthem, you say, oh, as loud as you can at the appropriate part for the Orioles. It's just an Oriole thing. It's been around forever. Um, and when I heard that at the pre-kickoff, I knew there was a ton of – it was the loudest I've ever heard it on an away game. So I knew it was going to be good there. But the game ended up being 27-14. Rodgers had a couple interceptions. Flacco, of course, I think he had three. Um, it was a good game overall. I really didn't care who wins. I just wanted to have fun and, and enjoy the moment. At the uh, the end of the game, players are walking off the field, so I ran over to <clears throat> the end zone where they were walking in. We were all hanging over the rail, and me, a couple other Raven fans, Packer fans, just trying to yell stuff and get them to throw equipment up to us, hopefully. And uh, – Chris Carr, defensive back for the Ravens, is walking through, and I'm yelling over the railing like, hey, throw me them gloves. <laughs> he takes them off and throws them up in the air, and in that moment I was like, don't drop. It was like slow motion, but I grabbed him. I got him as souvenirs. His hands are super small. I can't even put them on, but it was awesome. Then the security came down and yelled at us to get off the railing. Um Overall, though, it was so fun. It was freezing, but it was definitely worth it. The game was pretty crazy. Back and forth. Um, great crowd. I think they sold it out at like 70000 That was before the additions and stuff went on the Lambo. But, man, that was probably my favorite top moment of all time, getting to a, for an NFL experience. Um, thanks for having me on podcast and featuring my story. I appreciate it. Thanks. Have a good day. Hope you enjoyed it.
like I said, personal experience that most of us cannot replicate. I would love to go to Lambeau Field and watch my Detroit Lions take on the Packers. I'm not so sure I'd want to go in the fridge of cold like you talked about. It'd be super cool to be right there deep down in the end zone when they go and do that Lambeau leap. But as I was listening to it, I was like, I don't know why this part stuck out to me, but it was so funny when he's like, hey, pass me that gloves. And then uh, at the point he goes, you know, I got Chris Carr's gloves and his hands were super small. And I'm like, I don't know why that's important, but it was just so funny when he just kind of like randomly tossed that in there. But uh, like he said, um, Frank Bonacontri. And if you want to hit him up on Twitter, you can search the Fantasy Football Wire or you can look him up at his Twitter handle at the FFL Wire. Now let's go on to our next listener. This one comes in from Ramona Rice. And here's that clip. Hi, my name is Ramona Rice. I am formerly the host of the Sports Gal Pal podcast, and I am an avid, avid lover of the NFL. And my favorite team is the Philadelphia Eagles. I was born in Philadelphia. I love their gritty spirit. And you might think my favorite NFL memory is, of course, us winning finally the um, Super Bowl this past year. But actually, my favorite NFL memory is a great lesson from the amazing running back, Brian Westbrook. Brian Westbrook, in my opinion, is the all-time best running back in the NFL in history. I don't care what you say about um, Emmitt Smith. I don't care about anybody else other than Brian Westbrook because he really let me fall in love with the position, just how important a great running back is to an offense and how when you can utilize them effectively, can you rack up some points? And my favorite memory actually happened in 2007 when um, Brian Westbrook did something that at the time, I was so mad about um, as a fantasy football owner, but it was the right decision, and it's such just a great message. And what he did was um, we were clinging to a 10-6 lead over over Dallas with only two minutes, with a little bit over two minutes left in the game. When Brian Westbrook does what he does, and he got the ball from McNabb, and he broke through the line and was in total like open field. I'm talking that he ran like literally like yards and yards and yards. And I had him on my fantasy football team. This is late in the season. This is December. And I am just like so freaking excited. I stand up and I'm like, oh my God, so much points, so many points. And we're going to get the lead again. And we're going to stuff it to Dallas at home. Yes. All the good things, right? Then Brian Westbrook takes a knee on the one-yard line, and I was devastated. You would have thought that like, Dallas had gotten like the ball back or something and had scored a touchdown, how devastated I was. And when you look back on that, it, it just put, you know, scoring that touchdown would have been like, oh, my God, just the biggest upset. And then when he stopped the one-yard line, what it allowed the Eagles to do was run out the clock. And I think we forget that running out the clock in the NFL is actually a really important thing. Time management, when you can own that time, is so critical for success in teams. I mean, look at what Belichick does. Look at the mistakes, um, including Andy Reid did, um, n- not being able to do clock management. There's a difference between winners and losers. And Brian Westbrook understanding that. And the story about that is actually is that um, he his right tackle um, – Runyon actually was the one who told him, like, you know, do not, if you get down to the one line, take the knee, take the knee, take the knee. It went against every instinct Brian Westbrook had. And, you know, he's just like, take the knee, take the knee. Um, it, it just seriously, it, it was, it's the best lesson. It's a great memory. Um, it's such, because I lost that fantasy football matchup, but in the end, it just showed the, the football intelligence of Brian Westbrook, just listening to his teammates, the humbleness of it, because, you know, a guy who is all about himself would have went ahead and scored that touchdown and still it wouldn't have been enough. Um, and the Cowboys could have come back and won the game. So instead, Westbrook thought about the entire picture of the game and the season and took the knee. And that's my favorite NFL memory. So after listening to that, I was like, yes, I totally remember that play. It's like, dude, you're crushing my football league, but like, I totally get it. And you're a consummate teammate and professional and, I can't ever knock you, but at the same time, I want those fantasy points and just like, ah, and that's the beauty of fantasy football because every single moment, every play can like make your entire day good or bad. But it was cool how she brought it back to how, like the reason why Brian Westbrook's her favorite player. 
And not necessarily because of all the physical attributes, but it was because of that, like I said, consummate teammate and professional. And that is what football is all about. Any of you that played it knows that there's a huge camaraderie factor in football. And you can find Ramona over at podcast websites, which happens to be the place that I host my show. They have an awesome team over there, and Ramona is part of it. Um, basically helping noobs like me out, you know, get into this podcasting game. Um, they they offer you a website, like designing that's super easy, click and drag, and they do your hosting and just all sorts of stuff. Uh, highly recommend if you're ever interested in getting into podcasting that you check it out. And if you are, hit me up because I've got an affiliate link and, you know, you can help support the show out a little bit if you'd like. But now let's go on to our next listener. And it comes from Jeremy McFarlane. And if any of you are on Twitter, he's the dude that gave me that sweet pick of the old school Lions ticket from back in 1958. And here's his clip. Yeah, my name is Jeremy, and I'm giving my favorite NFL memory. I've got several, but I want to kind of sum it up real quick. I had the opportunity in 1998 to go to Canton, Ohio, and that was a great memory. Uh, my dad took me up there. I got to see several things that only read about but my favorite memory is the music city miracle i grew up a broncos fan because they had john elway and i watched them lose three super bowls and win two and those were great memories but when elway retired the titans had moved on to nashville which is close to where i grew up and i always wanted a team close by to root for I always wanted the team to say that this is it. So when the Broncos came to Nashville to play the then the Tennessee Oilers, I got a chance to watch them, and I started to enjoy watching the Titans. I got a chance to meet several of the players beforehand when they were moving from Memphis. It was great opportunity, so I started to say, you know, this team can do something. This team could be something special for us. So there I was. At Robbins Park there in Dixon at a birthday party for an 85 year old lady at the church where I attended when I heard some cheering I went behind the screen and there was a TV and people were watching the Tennessee Titans Baltimore excuse me Buffalo Bills playoff game and the Titans of course were down and they said the Titans need a miracle. If they're going to do it, they're going to do it now. And Mike Keith, uh, great call that he did. And I know I could see the kick landing in Lorenzo Neal's arms. And he pitches it to Wycheck, And Wycheck throws it across the, the field to Kevin Dyson. And Kevin Dyson runs it in. And I can remember everybody cheering. I'm jumping up and down, yelling and screaming. And we waited till Phil Luckett got up and said that there are it was not a forward lateral. It was a it was a, a pitch backwards, and everything was fine. The Titans, of course, went on uh, to go one yard short in the Super Bowl the next year. But that is my memory. My office where I work, I have memories of that great play in 2000 up on my wall. That is my favorite memory in the NFL. So, yeah, Music City Miracle. Awesome name. Awesome time. Awesome game. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in the kitchen at my old house with my parents, and we were watching on a little TV, and, you know, I make the joke that, you know, I was probably eating spam sandwiches or something, but I just remember when it happened, walking, like, running back and forth from the kitchen to the living room, the kitchen to the living room, just super excited. I was like, that's crazy. There's no way that should have ever happened. And, I mean, I had no skin in the game because Titans, Bills, I was like, whatever. But it was just super cool because it was NFL playoff football and it was just an experience and an event and a moment that I got to watch live that people were going to talk about for years to come kind of reminded me of you know the helmet catch David Tyree in the Super Bowl that flipped and blew out people's minds like nobody's business or how about the time that Odell Beckham basically broke the internet with that one-handed grab in the end zone but that's why it's so cool he grew up a Denver Broncos fan, but then they had a new team coming, and he got to cheer for him. He was at the party. Uh, football, man, it's just like sweet. You know, it's so cool. And if you want to go ahead and talk to this cool dude, 
You can uh, check him out on Twitter. Like I said, his name is Jeremy McFarlane, and his Twitter handle is at J6Mac underscore Cutler. Now we're going to kick it on over to another listener. And this guy's name is Anthony Collins. In fact, I kind of know this dude. He's a cool cat I work with. Uh, Let's just say this moment, the guy that he talks about, he talked about him like all the time ever since I knew him. But I want to really give it away. So I'm going to head on over to you, Anthony. Here you go. My greatest moment in NFL history is when my favorite player, Terrell Owens, made it to the Super Bowl with the Philadelphia Eagles. For those who don't know who Terrell Owens is, he's one of the top five greatest receivers of all time, in my opinion. He's second all-time in receptions, receiving yards. He's eighth all-time in receptions. And he's third all-time in receiving touchdowns, only behind Randy Moss and Jerry Rice. The reason why my favorite moment is when he went to the Super Bowl is because he was such an outstanding player that he broke his leg before the Super Bowl and he still managed to make nine catches for 122 yards. That's amazing. I think that was one of the most inspiring things for me because it just showed me how much of a tough player my favorite player was and it showed how he had fought through adversity and was still able to get the job done. There is even an account from Asante Samuel, a cornerback that played for the opposite team that said, he was amazed at how good T.O. was able to play with a broken leg. And he even said that he was afraid to play him when he was healthy. That was my greatest moment in NFL history. You know, my favorite part about that was when he talked about Asante Samuel talking about how he was, like, basically afraid to play T.O., especially when he was healthy. And that's something I never heard about. But I do remember that specific game. And I remember how it seemed like near impossible that T.O. was going to come back and actually play after a broken leg. Like, what? You broke your leg, man. How are you going to come back? And the dude, for everything that anybody wants to talk about, as far as, you know, weird stuff going on upstairs, he he was a freak athlete who just worked harder than anybody on the field, and really off the field, too. So, got to give it to him. Yes, Anthony, that's some major props for you. Right there, finally, your boy getting drafted into the... Pro Football Hall of Fame, and no longer will he be, you know, I'm using these air quotes, shafted, as you say, the travesty. But now we're going to take it on to another cool cat that I work with, and his name is Robert Haynes. He's a Steelers fan from Florida, but I gave him slack because, you know, he told me that Barry Sanders was pretty much one of his favorite players of all time to watch, and it's his best running back, hands down, to watch. So I'm like, okay, you're cool, dude. I can accept that answer. And here's this clip. Hello. I'm making this recording for the football history dude's memorable moments. It's hard to find one memorable moment in all the years that I've been watching football. But if I had to whittle it down to a moment or a game, there would be moments in this game that I didn't know at the time, but afterwards would learn to know. It was December 10th, 1983, at Shea Stadium. The New York Jets were playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. Both teams had playoff aspirations. The Jets had to win this game to make the playoffs. The Steelers, I think, could have lost, but the Steelers handedly won this game there's a couple of things that makes this game important and the moments in it one of my favorite quarterbacks terry bradshaw hadn't played all year and this was near the end of the season and at the time no one would know but this was the only game he would play in that season and in that game he only threw eight passes Two of those passes were for touchdowns, and the Steelers would go on to win this game and make the playoffs. The Jets, on the other hand, lost this game and didn't make the playoffs, and this was the game that was the last home game in their stadium of Shea Stadium. The fans in this game, at the near the end of the game, started to rip that stadium apart. And I remember watching this game on TV and seeing that. I mean, they they ripped seats out, they ripped out parts of the scoreboards, and they kept these things. Then at the end of the game, they 
storming the field. They were tearing out pieces of grass. They took down the goalposts and all and all of these things for souvenirs. But the thing of it is, is that is the last game that Terry Bradshaw ever played. And I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know that would be his last game. But looking back on it, it's it's sad. And I did get to watch it. It was on TV. So, that I mean, he, he threw a couple of touchdown passes, like I say. He only threw eight. Two of them were touchdowns. And they handedly won that game. But I also feel bad for the Jet fans who lost their team because this was the last time they played in New York. After this, they played in New Jersey. And they had to go to New Jersey to watch their team. So that was kind of sad for them too. But as crazy as it was with them doing what they did at the end of that game, it's, it's they weren't fighting each other. There was no trouble. They just, they were all trying to collect memorabilia of that stadium I just remember watching them ripping out seats and I've heard in years later that those fans that have those seats they try to find those jet players and get them to autograph them and stuff so but anyway I would say that was one of my most exciting moments and games I mean like I say at the time I didn't know that was Terry Bradshaw's last game but it ended up being his last game. And that was sad to me because the years after that for Steeler fans were not good. So anyhow, that that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I'll talk to you later. So I'm not, you know, that far into, I guess, that modern into the NFL yet as far as my research goes so I don't know a whole lot about Bradshaw other than the stuff I've heard from you know his talk shows and such and his Super Bowl winnings but uh, yeah that was that was interesting for me it was very informative uh, and after even talking to Robert after he sent me this clip he said you know I really didn't know everything about that favorite moment until I started doing more research and I just football is so cool that it's like we can share these moments and we can relive our past and our history. And, you know, he was talking about the fans and there's got to be such a mix of emotions when, you know, your team is playing at the stadium for the last time. Like, you know, I'm just thinking about the Raiders and that long storied franchise. And it's like, man, just cool and sucks at the same time, you know? So anyway, I would really want to thank all the listeners that send in their stories, which I'm going to go ahead and try to get this popular called My Football Moment, which I'm going to start, hey, go ahead and use a hashtag, you know what I mean? And if any of you want to be featured in an upcoming episode, make sure you head over to myfootballmoment.com, where I give you more details on how you go about doing it. And of course, I got to ask you to subscribe to the show so you can help the stories get up there higher in the rankings. And now I'm going to ask you for a shameless ask. I'm going to beg of you please head on over to your favorite podcast player and leave an honest review of the show so I can get feedback, so I can know what you like, and I can know what I got to do differently to make it better for you. And of course, if you head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com, you can sign up for my newsletter so you can get even more football history access. And one final thing, sorry for all the uh, mentions here, but if you want to go to Twitter, my handle is at FHDude. But before I wrap this thing up, I got to let you know, you can head over to thefootballhistorydude.com slash episode six for the show notes. You can pretty much get any of the stuff that I talked about in here. And if you wanted to reach out to these guys, but for now, I hope you enjoyed this special listener episode of the football history dude. And I want you to ask yourself, what is my favorite football moment? Then head on over to myfootballmoment.com to share your story. In the next episode, we are finally going to get to hear about the life of Bronco Nagurski, the monster of the Midway. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, 
please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to the footballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.